I only knew my mother 15 years. She fought cancer from the time I was in 7th grade until I was in 10th. And then she died. She died before I had a chance to vent all that great adolescent rage. <laughs> When most of my friends were trying to prove that they weren't mama's boys, I, I missed my mom. So my visions of mother are pretty idyllic. Arrested at the stage where I believed she was pretty wonderful. I did not go through that stage of being angry at her for being less than perfect. Nor was I ever able to talk with her adult to adult and be reconciled with the human being that she really was. Yet she lives on in me. Her presence is with me. Sometimes I'm surprised by anniversaries. Like when I turned 30 and realized I had lived as long with her as without her. And now that I'm past 60, I've lived three times as long without her as I have did with her. Like when I turned 35, the age I was when she had me. Or when I turned 50, the age she was when she died. Her memory grows more distant. I have pictures of her in my house. There's one in your order of service today. But there are indelible lessons that are impossible for me to unlearn. I want to share with you today things I learned from my mother. And as I do, I want you to think of things that you learned from your mother, and perhaps you might want to share those during joys and sorrows. The first thing my mother taught me was to appreciate other people particularly my two sisters and my brother. I was the youngest of four kids, and like any four kids, we would squabble. And when we would squabble, my mother would say, I was an only child for 11 years, and it was 15 years before I had a sister. You kids should appreciate each other. By the time I came along, my older brothers and sisters were so sick of hearing that <laughs> that they had arranged a deal that she would pay them a nickel every time she said it. <laughs> She'd start to repeat herself, and we'd all scream, nickel, nickel, nickel. <laughs> and it still was effective. It stopped the fight because we were all greedy. <laughs> Another thing she often said was, it takes all kinds to make this world. That was her version of the Southernism, well, bless her hearts. <laughs> that was her when she was really angry. And, but it probably set those seeds of universalism in me, that even those people that you're most angry at, belong here. Well, there was a deeper notion to this phrase. Uh, we lived in northern Michigan and there were no black people in our county. And I remember going down to visit my grandma Davis who lived in suburban Detroit. And grandma Davis was worried about the coloreds who were moving into her neighborhood. And my mother told me, pay no attention to Grandma Davis. She's wrong. And I was 
six years old. And it was so profound to have one adult telling me that another adult was wrong. Because this was the 60s where any adult had a right to correct you, slap you for no reason at all, just for <laughs> being on the street at some time and annoying them. So there was this, this sense of, yes, there are things that are right and wrong. But my mom was not, by any means, politically correct. In 1963, our, our bowling team that our grocery store sponsored dressed as an interracial family. So one person dressed as a Mexican and one person dressed as someone from Holland and one person dressed as someone from Japan. And my mother put on blackface. And so about a week later, in my family's grocery store, which was on the highway, I actually saw my first black person. And I'm about three years old, and I walk up to this lady, and I run my finger down the back of her leg, and say, it doesn't come off. <laughs> And my dad says that he turned about four shades paler white than he already was and was happy that the lady laughed. Later in the 60s, my oldest sister brought black men home from college to meet the family. And my mother reacted by buying books about the civil rights movement and saying to me, I guess I need to learn more about this. She knew that it takes all kind to make this world. And it saddens me that she never got to meet Gail, my wife. I know that they would have enjoyed talking. And I know that she would have enjoyed her grandson, Ben. For my mother liked to play. She taught me it was important to stay young at heart. She was actually older than most of my friends' moms because I was the youngest. And, and, but she would be the one mother who would be down at the beach playing with the ball and throwing the ball. And, and you know, everybody would say, your mom is just so active. And, they, and, and she took four of us kids down to Detroit, it was a trip about 326 miles, to see the Beatles. And so that was just an amazing thing for a woman to do in those days. And then one Christmas, when we kids were 10, 13, 16, and 19, she bought us the strangest gift. It was a red and blue toddler ball with yellow blocks. It was a preschool toy where you took the blocks and you stuck them in the triangle, a cube, a circle, an oval, a star. And we were just insulted <laughs> that she would buy such an infantile toy to all of us who were so grown. But that day, she brought out her wristwatch and said, we're going to time each other so you can do it the fastest. And that's the only toy that I remember that Christmas. Because we all sat there trying to sit with that little preschool toy. My mom was very religious. She took us to the Presbyterian church and she taught me a Christianity that was about love. And she would often say, don't hate people, hate their wicked ways. In fact, she actually said to us, when you're on the playground, don't say, I hate you. Just turn to that child and say, I hate your wicked ways. <laughs> I never did this. 
because I felt their wicked ways would soon be inflicted upon me. <laughs> But underneath that nerdiness, there's a meaning that I've carried with me as I've journeyed into Unitarian Universalism. Every person has inherent worth and dignity. We may not like what some people do. And they may even hate us. But that doesn't give us permission to hate them. It's more important whenever we are angered with someone to separate the person from the act. You may dislike the behavior, but not the person. So, for the incoming board and board president, if we're ever in a heated debate in the committee meeting and I say, I hate your wicked ways, <laughs> know that it is my mother watching me keeping me from saying something meaner. And even though my mother was religious, she taught me that religion was a choice. When my brother was in the eighth grade, it was time for him to be confirmed and join the Presbyterian Church. And my brother said they did not believe the vows that he was required to say. And this was probably an embarrassment to her. She was one of the pillars of the church. She was the head of Circle Two of women. And, and you know, all the other kids were just doing it because their parents made them. And I knew that my brother's friends were no more religious than he was. But my mother told my brother, she was proud of him for being honest. So three years later, when I joined the church, I knew it was my choice and not my mother's. And I know that she also chose to be a mother. She had her four children over a 10 year period of time. She was a nurse and we were all three years apart. <laughs> I know there was some planning going on. And so I was born in 1960 and birth control did not become a right in this country until 1965 in the Griswold case. And the Griswold case used the right for privacy to say that this reproductive choice is an inherent right and should not be interfered with by the government. And it was that same right for privacy that allowed my wife and I to get married because our marriage wasn't legal until 1967 also built upon that right of privacy. And in the leaked opinion that is probably going to overturn Roe v. Wade, it says that right to privacy doesn't exist. And so those who claim that they are for small government want the federal government inside our bedrooms. And if not our bedrooms, the bedrooms of our children and our grandchildren. Motherhood is a choice. May it remain so. The last thing my mother taught me was that dying is okay. I remember the miracle of her last Christmas. She was very ill. Chemotherapy was taking its toll and not helping. Dad had told the relatives not to visit because she was so sick, which of course prompted all the relatives to come and visit. 
And because of this, my mother perked up and was the perfect entertainer and lifted everybody's spirit. But after the holidays, there was a steady decline to her death. And I remember one February afternoon, her best friend was coming to visit. And it was Audrey, who was the soprano in the choir. And she was such a good soprano that even though she was Presbyterian, she was known by the Catholics in town as the Ave Maria lady because she would be hired to sing at every wedding and funeral in the Catholic Church. And I always loved to be in the room when Audrey and Mom talked. The sheer volume of the verbiage was vibrant. And, and certainly I learned things about people in the town that I should have never known. <laughs> but this afternoon, Mom said, I don't want you to come in the room. She said, Audrey's been reading about faith healing. I don't think I believe in it. She was a nurse, very practical. But she wants to give it a try. And that was so weird, you know. She, she knew the reality of the situation. But she knew her friend had to do this. She wasn't worried about her own healing, but helping that friend. Wow, 45 years. One day, we got the news from the hospital that she probably wasn't going to make it. And I prayed as hard as I could. I read the Bible and cried. And then I had a really religious experience. At a time, it felt like God was giving me a hug. I had this overwhelming feeling that everything was going to be okay, even though she was dying. <coughs> you know, later I went to college, and I was trained in psychology, and master's in social work, and I'd learned to call this type of thing a cathartic release. But it's something that doesn't need to be named. It's something that taught me that dying is okay. Over the next few years, I went to college and I saw my friends struggle to break free from their mothers. And I kind of realized I was lucky that I always had this perfect mother. I knew she was human. And I saw my older siblings rebel against her, and, but my personal memories are pleasant. And now I've seen my peers worrying about their aging parents, and they're starting to experience that painful role reversal. And they have to deal with their parents as real people, and even as children. <laughs> And that's why Mother's Day can be such a difficult holiday. Because it doesn't honor real mothers. It honors the mythical, perfect mother. And it's easy to see why the image of goddess or God, the mother, is helpful to some. Because it's an image that uses her power to truly nurture but when power and responsibility are given to a deity, what is left for humans? I feel that humans should claim the power and responsibility for themselves. We need both. Without both, we cannot be whole. Male and female and transgendered people can claim the power and responsibility of mothering anybody who needs to be nurtured. 
Mothers who reject the role of suffering servants are able to be whole and teach their sons and daughters to be whole. Gods and goddesses are able to be perfect, but none of us are. And neither was our mother, whoever she may have been or be. And the beauty of our human interaction, the forbearance, the forgiveness, the hope, the joy and the laughter is what makes it real and what makes it precious. So this day, as you think about your mother, love her as a real person. And remember, it takes all kinds to make this world. Love her even if you hate some of her wicked ways. <laughs> I've been motherless since I was 15. You kids should appreciate your... Oh, I probably owe you a nickel. <laughs> but rather than paying you a nickel... Later in the service, you'll have the opportunity to put in your own two cents <laughs> if you want to share a memory of your mother during our joys and sorrows. What images do mothers, does Mother Day create in your mind? Who is the human being that was or is your mother? And what have you learned from her? May we bless and be blessed.